Amen. God is good. So if you're ready for the word, as you know, we're in a series right now on the furniture of the tabernacle, Moses' tabernacle. This is the fourth piece of, of furniture. And we're going to talk about the, 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 the golden candlestick. This is a poor representative. <laughs> it's so sad. But it, it does have seven, you know, it's, it's just something for you to kind of put your eyeball on. But this is what it really looked like, and it was, uh, we'll get into it and what it, what it was made of and, and all that in just a minute. But after, after like 10 generations of captivity, 400 years of captivity, they come out of Egypt, right? And... They come into the wilderness, and God tells them to build this tabernacle. And the question is why, and I guess another question is why is it important in the New Testament? It's important because the tabernacle is the pattern of worship. And even though we don't do sacrifices and all that, we don't do the stuff they did in the, in, in the tent in the wilderness, still, still I want you to understand that everything in the tent points to Jesus. And everything, every color, every material, uh, every, 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 everything, how it was made, the dimensions, everything. I mean, I mean we, could, we could preach on and just bore you to death with every little thing because every little thing points to Jesus. And every little thing is a pattern for us to help us know how to worship. How many think it might be important for us to know, <laughs> to know how to worship? Gloria found a better piece. Doesn't she always? Do it right, yeah. Well, that's still not exactly, but that's a lot closer. <laughs> I had to do it. <laughs> what, what am I going to do with it now? I don't know. But, yeah, it's got the little, little knobs on it, and it, it's a lot closer. It's heavier, but not yet pure gold, so there's, there's that. <laughs> if it was pure gold, it wouldn't be there anymore. <laughs> We'd melt that baby down. We'd... <laughs> <laughs> we laugh, but they kind of did that in the Old Testament, didn't they? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm going to talk about that in just a minute. So, so here's the thing. They, they came out of Egypt. They were delivered out of Egypt. And listen, they defeated Pharaoh's army, but they were still carrying Pharaoh's God. Because as soon as the, Moses, Pastor Moses went up to the mountaintop, mm -hmm. what did they do? They melted down their gold, made a calf, and, and, and it's the funniest line in the whole scriptures when Moses comes down and he asks Aaron, what are you doing? How did this happen? And Aaron says, I don't know. I, we threw this gold in the fire and this calf jumped out. I mean, Literally, King James Version, that's it. Really? It sounds like some of our excuses, right? I just threw the gold in there and a calf jumped out. Huh. So while they're up there receiving the Ten Commandments and talking to God, they're down below dancing and singing and shouting, and there's nothing wrong with that. As long as you're singing and shouting and dancing to the right God. You see, he had to take them out of Egypt and, and, and build this tabernacle because, like I said, they defeated Pharaoh's army, but they, were, but they were still worshiping Pharaoh's God. After 10 generations, it seems like they couldn't get Pharaoh, Pharaoh's God out of their mind. Sometimes people get saved, but they still can't get their old lifestyle out of. They, they still hang on to things back there that they, that they really need to, need to get rid of. Is, is anybody hearing what I'm saying? So, see, see, when we say worship, what pops in our head is singing, 
maybe dancing, shouting, speaking in tongues. Maybe an old-fashioned helicopter. (laughs) I mean, this is what we think of. But listen, when God thinks of worship, first thing pops in his head is sacrifice. That's not what pops in our head. What pops in our head is the good times. What pops in our, in our head is, I wish they would just sing a song that I like. Then I could worship. It's just, it's just really different the way we look at worship. And isn't it interesting, when Moses came down off the mountain, and, you know, at, when he came down, he didn't see anybody sacrificing anything. He saw them dancing, rejoicing. It was like a drunken brawl. And they thought that was worship, but that was the worship from Egypt. Now, I'm not saying that we can't sing and we can't shout and we can't rejoice. I'm not saying that at all. But you know what? Everything needs to be wrapped around worship. It needs to be wrapped around sacrifice. Come on. I know it's hard to pull an amen on that. But everything needs to be wrapped around sacrifice and the the golden uh, candlestick gives us and, and you know they call it that but really there weren't there was no wax in this thing there were no candles they hadn't even invented candles yet but let's look at how this thing was made in exodus chapter 25 you ready you shall also make a lampstand of pure gold say pure gold the lampstand shall be of Hammered work. Mm. Its shaft, its branches, its bowls, its ornamental knobs and flowers shall be of one piece. Now imagine this. <laughs> Can you imagine, you know, somebody, I, I was reading, somebody actually tried to rebuild this and couldn't figure it out. I mean, this, how God, I don't, I don't know how they made this thing because it was one solid piece of gold. And then they hammered it in place. And I don't know if they drilled the, I don't know how they did that, but it was all one solid piece of gold. Some say probably weighed about 100 pounds. At $1,850 an ounce, that thing was worth, in today's money, about $30 million. (laughs) Thank you, Egypt. That's where we stole it from. Amen. (laughs) Come on. Some of you say, what? Yeah, I'll read your Bible. (laughs) I can't get into everything. Yeah, 30, I'm sorry, 3 million. I'm sorry. Uh, I should have wrote, I should have looked at my notes first. Still, 3 million? Is it, can I still get an ooh and an ah? Okay. <laughs> Glory says, no, we're over it. We're over it. We're, no, we're not impressed anymore. <laughs> okay, let's keep reading. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> and six branches shall come out of its sides, and three branches of the lampstand out of one side, and three branches of the lampstand out of the other side. Okay, one in the middle, that makes seven. Three bowls shalt thou make like almond blossoms on one branch with an ornamental knob and flower, and three bowls made like almond block. Can you imagine giving this guy instruction on how to make this? on the other branch with ornamental knob and a flower. And so for the six branches that come out of the lampstand, anybody confused yet? On the lampstand itself, four bowls shall be made like almond blossoms, each with its ornamental knob and flower. By the way, what it's saying there is this this is the developmental stage of the almond, uh, all the way from just, you know, just, just the bud to the to the you know to the to the knob to the actual flower that comes out on the on the uh, almond tree and it was the flower that was made like a cup where the oil was placed in we're going to get into that 
under the second, uh, on the second, the two branches of the same, and a knob under the third, two branches of the same, according to the six branches that extend from the lampstand. <laughs> their knobs and their branches shall be of one piece. All of it shall be one hammered piece of pure gold, and shall make seven lamps for it, and they shall arrange its lamps so that they give light in front of it. It throws out the light. And its wick trimmers and their trays shall be of pure gold. It shall be made of a talent of pure gold with all these utensils. And see to it that you make them according to the pattern. Can you say that with me? Make sure you make them what? According to the pattern which was shown you on the mountain. Make sure you do it right. I don't know that we can worship just any old way. It has to be God's way. I want you to notice it was one beaten work of solid gold. Jesus was beaten. He was beaten, and he was gold. This lampstand represents Jesus Christ. We'll read it later, but he shouts out, I am the light of the world. He is the golden lampstand. Praise God. Number two, I want you to understand the oil for the lampstand was made from God's recipe, and it was provided, say provided, by the people. They had to bring the oil. God did not supernaturally provide the oil. It had to be made a certain way. In fact, later on, we're going to preach a message, and I'm going to steal from an old title from 30 years ago, Recipe of the Anointing. And that's going to be one of our messages going forward. Uh, we're going to preach that on Pentecost Sunday. Ooh, glory to God, because you have to preach on the Holy Ghost on that day. So here, so here, so here it is. God's people had to do the recipe, and we won't get into that because that's a sermon later, and it had to be provided. Does that remind you of the ten virgins? Go out and buy oil for your lamp. There, listen, there are responsibilities that God lays on Christians, and one of those responsibilities is to keep your oil, keep your lamp full of oil. Yeah, that's on you. Amen. I can't lay hands on you and say, receive oil in the name of Jesus. There are things you need to do. You need to get up in the morning and fill your lamp with oil. That's your responsibility. Amen. Don't be like the five foolish virgins who got caught without oil in the lamp. It's, to, mm, my God, hallelujah. Can I take that a little farther? Pastors, it's on pastors to make sure that the church has oil in the lamp. Hallelujah. That every time we gather in the name of Jesus, there's a fire on the altar and oil in the lamp. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. This is where we're missing it. We're playing too many games and too much silliness and nonsense. We're more concerned about making people happy. Then we are pleasing the King of kings and the Lord of lords. There is a pattern to worship, and we need to find it and follow it. Give him praise in the house. Listen, don't fool yourself. This oil was costly. It was not cheap. We'll get into all the ingredients, and they were very expensive. Leviticus chapter 24 Verse 1 and 2, then the Lord spoke to Moses saying, command the children of Israel that they bring to you pure oil of pressed olives for the light to make the lamps burn. When we feel like it, Sunday morning only. How about Monday morning when you're not feeling it? <laughs> Continually Because if the light goes out, the room goes dark. Oh, my God. Uh, next verse. Is that it? Next verse. Is that it? That's two verses? Yes. Praise God. 
Even if it wasn't, they're going, yeah, I think so. <laughs> Not only must they keep oil in the lamp, but they have to keep it trimmed, keep it full, keep it burning. I, I kind of grew up with this growing up Catholic. I was an altar boy. Ecom Spirit the 220. We used to laugh. That's a phone number. I think that's a. No, we had to learn all the Latin and all that stuff. But anyway, right in the middle of the sanctuary, hanging from that huge, tall ceiling, our church was over 100 years old, and there was a long chain with a, with a lamp with red glass, and, the, and there was a candle in that that always burned. And one of the nuns, that was their job to make sure they would drop that thing and they would light another candle, take the old one out, put the new one in. And there was always a light burning in the sanctuary. And that always impressed me and reminded me, even as a little Catholic boy, that there's something about the house of God that's different than every other house. And there's something burning, supposed to be burning, in the house of God that's maybe not burning elsewhere. And the presence of God. Maybe we should hang a candle in here. I don't know, fire code, if that's even a right. But maybe we should have something in here just to remind us that the presence of God needs to be in the house of God. And we bear some responsibility. The Holy Spirit doesn't go where he's not wanted. He does not live where he's pushed out. And we must be like the five wise virgin, virgins and keep our lamps full. 1 Samuel chapter 3 and verse 3. How many still with me? How many know the story of Samuel? We sang the song. And before the lamp of God went out, in the tabernacle of the Lord where the ark of God was, and while Samuel was lying down. For some reason, at some point, that light, I, I mean, I could see it flickering. Somebody didn't fill the oil up. It starts dying down, dying down. Samuel's Samuel's asleep because no one's, no one's waking him up. Church, we have responsibility to wake up the next generation. And where's Eli? Eli's too old. Eli's a type of the dying church that we're seeing in the world today. He's old. He's overweight. He's blind. And when he falls over, he breaks his neck because he's stiff-necked too. It's a type of the church today. Old, blind, fat. <laughs> stiff-necked. The neck is always symbolic of the will. It wants its own way. It wants to just sit in its chair and think about the good old days. Instead of making sure the lamp is lit. God. Oh, this, this, this bothers me. Oh, but wait a minute. Samuel had sons. There's hope. <laughs> Y'all know the story. Samuel's sons were corrupt. They, they would go... They would go to the, when, the, when everyone brings in the offering, they stuck in a pitchfork and say, hmm, look, look what I got. They were stealing from the house of God. So the light's going out. The young generation is asleep. The old generation has lost interest. And the one that's supposed to be really doing the work, they're corrupt. They're interested in their own things and their own ways. They're interested in getting ahead in the politics and the money. It's no wonder the light's going out. But I, but all of a sudden the voice of God comes to Samuel. Awake, Samuel, and light the lamp. 
God wake up this young generation and let them rise up and light the lamp of God again for the last days. Jesus. Generation after generation, priests came, priests died. Priests went on vacation. Priests did this, priests did that, but somebody always stepped up. Somebody always stepped up and kept the lamp lit until that day. And the lamp went out. But Samuel's coming. Oh, my God. I said, Samuel's coming. Too many pastors are letting the light go out. They're careless. Or they just don't care. Or their mind is somewhere else thinking they can have success through other means. When the only real success comes from the oil of God. The only true move, the only true growth is when God, when God brings a soul to him. Hallelujah. I want you to see that the oil burns in the almond fruit. I want you to understand, we, we Pentecostals are sometimes really good about the power, but not always as good about the fruit. There are some churches, they're just so good at love, but there's no power. And some churches have a lot of power, but all they do is fight. Hello, Corinthians. <laughs> the oil hmm, <laughs> burns in the fruit. If there's no fruit, there's no real fire. Oh, now you're, now you're not going to shout anymore. <laughs> you, listen, we have to have some character in our lives, some discipline in our lives, some fruit in our lives to support the gifts in our lives. It's kind of like a triangle, right? The base is the fruit of the Spirit, and as you go up, you have the gifts on top of that. But some people have that inverted, they have a lot of gifts, but no fruit. And that, how many know that triangle is not stable? That's why, let me answer someone's question. That's why you ask the question sometimes. I heard about that pastor who, who, who's been having an affair with, with the piano player or the secretary, whoever it is, and, and that, that's been going on for six years, and he's been preaching every Sunday. I don't understand how that happens. They've had a lot of gifts, but somehow their lives have shrunk. The gifts of God are without repentance. So people, that listen, a lot of churches are still operating in stuff, but if there's no fruit, if there's no character, if there's no discipline, if there's no discipleship, it cannot forever support what God wants done in the house of God. Oh, if you don't take away anything else, take that away. The oil burns in the fruit. Fruit is necessary for fire. And then, you know, a lot of people have a lot of foliage, but not much fruit. I'm not talking about foliage. I'm talking about fruit. How many remember the fig tree had foliage and Jesus cursed it because it didn't have any fruit? How many know that's another sermon for another time? Listen, it's purpose. What's the purpose? It, its purpose is to light up the holy place. There, there are no lights there. The out, outside's lit by the sun and moon. But when you come into the holy place, if the lamp's not lit, there is no fire. There is no light. It said that, because you see, when you come in, the lampstand is to your left, the communion table to the right, the altar of incense is straight ahead. The light shines across the room 
15 foot by 15 foot and shines on the bread. You can't eat or even see the bread if you don't have the light. <laughs> That's why sometimes people come to church and they walk out saying, I don't get it. I don't understand those people. Because they came for the wrong reason. They didn't have any light, so they didn't get any bread. Some people, some people come to church looking for a future spouse. That, that's why they're here. And they go away and say, I don't, I, don't know. I don't get it. I don't get it. Well, that's because you don't have any light. Some people come to church because the, uh, they want to make a connection with someone for their business or something. But listen, I don't know why you're here, but if you're not here, amen, to, to get the light from the gospel, if you're not here for the truth today, how many believe I'm preaching some truth today? Amen. If you're not here for the truth, you'll, you won't get the bread. Don't come for the bread if you don't want the truth. Don't come saying, oh, I'm hungry. Yeah, you might be hungry, but you can't even see the bread until you get the truth. We got too many preachers not preaching truth, and their people aren't getting fed. Come on, church. Oh, I feel the Lord in this place. Every point I want to spend 30 minutes on, and I know I can't. John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever lives right, whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. We know that verse, amen, because we see it on TV at football games. We I was driving somewhere, was it on the way to Shelby maybe or somewhere? Someone had it plastered on their garage door. That was pretty cool. Next verse. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Uh -huh. He who believes in him is not, but he who does not believe is condemned already. Jesus said, I don't have to condemn them. And you don't have to condemn them if they're already condemned. I want you, how many know we're not saved by works? We're saved by faith. We're saved because we believe. Now let me flip that over and mess with your mind here a little bit. We're not, we're not condemned because of what we do. We're condemned because we don't believe. Don't get all hung up on, oh, they do this and they're all, oh, you know, they're a sinner. No, it's not about that. Sinners sin, it's kind of what they do. Amen. Don't get all freaked out because sinners sin. Oh, you can well, yeah, they're a sinner. It's what sinners do. <laughs> Jesus, you know, and they're not going to hell because what they did, they'll miss heaven because they don't believe. You got to start understanding that, that you go, you're saved because you believe and you're, and you're condemned because you don't. So the goal is not to get people to live right. The goal is to get people to believe. And if they'll believe, they'll start living right. Just like if they don't believe, they don't live right. Duh. But we just don't get it all the time, right? Verse 19. And this is the condemnation. That the, the what? The light has come into the world. That's the condemnation. Because lights come in. And now we see. 
We see the works of darkness. And men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. Mm -hmm. For everyone practicing evil hates the light and does not come to the light lest his deeds should be exposed. But he who does the truth comes to the light that his deeds may be clearly seen that they have been done in God. Mm, 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 mm. Is anybody getting this? How many know it's dark versus light? But let, <laughs> Darkness is not a thing. Y'all aren't getting it, are you? Light is a thing. Come on, let's go back to high school physics. Light actually has particles. The other day, the Holy Spirit, I was walking by a flagpole. Hey, you preach 4,000 sermons, you get your illustrations anywhere you can. <laughs> you run out of ideas, believe me. Holy Spirit, help us. And I noticed something, which is obvious, I guess, but the flagpole was so high, and the, and, and, and the shadow of the flagpole was the same distance and the same width all the way to the end of the shadow. The light didn't bend around. The exact proportion of that flagpole had blocked out the exact amount of that much light. All darkness is is something obstructing <laughs> that 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 because darkness is not listen you can't adjust darkness you can't say make it darker in here you <laughs> the only way to change darkness is to adjust the light Oh, somebody's getting it in the house. Hallelujah. If you want a lighter in here, you turn the light up. Amen. And when you turn the light up, it drives the darkness out. Hallelujah. Listen, I'm to the point where maybe we need to just stop, you know, rebuking the darkness. Why don't you just turn up the light? You can't get rid of darkness unless you have more light. It's time, church, we learn how to light, fill it with oil, and light the candlestick of our lives. Whoo! My God, help us. That's why, that's why the priest had to come in and trim the lamps. They had the little golden tweezers, and they would trim it. Because the brightness of the light didn't depend on the oil, depended on the wick. And some of us are dim wicks. <laughs> well, I'm not allowed to say dim wit. I'm Sometimes, according to Ecclesiastes, a fly gets in the oil. Woo, go where they are. And you got to go in there and take the fly out. Get all that carbon out of there. All that spent material. We go through a lot of junk, and sometimes you just got to go back to the oil and say, let me get that out of here. Let me, let me put this out of here. And as you, as you clean out the carbon and get rid of the flies, amen, and you adjust the wick, glory, the light just begins to come up. Hallelujah. Now, let me tell you how old I am. When I went to see my grandma, my grandma on my mom's side out on the farm in Minnesota, you betcha. She did not have electricity to the day she died. Did not have running water. <laughs> she had an outhouse in Minnesota in the winter. 
it's not just that it's cold. It's, it's that the Sears magazine gets stiff. I thought Gloria would at least smile on that one. <laughs> you think I'm kidding. At night, at night, there was a spare bedroom, and that's where you went. And then they, they didn't heat that room, and that's where you went. And so you didn't have to go outside. That was a convenience. That was a convenience. But... Why did I get into that? Oh, uh, I, I even lost myself on that. <laughs> but my, my grandmother and, and, uh, lit the house with kerosene lanterns. And to this day, there's a feeling you get around a kerosene lantern. I don't know if any of you know what I'm talking about. But they throw off a different kind of light. And, 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 it, and it's warm around it. And there's that little <laughs> sound that you get from a kerosene lamp. And, and I, I just remember when the house got quiet and those, those lanterns would <laughs> and it just throw off that light and the shadows from the kerosene lamp. I'll never forget that as a child. But the thing you have to do, and I've actually lit them sometimes, and, and I, I bought some, so I had some at the home, so I've messed with them a little bit. But there's a little knob on there. And you can turn that up, and which is too much sometimes. And you can turn that down, but you had to get in there when it wasn't lit and trim that wick. Trim it so it's even. Trim it so all the carbon is, is off of it. And then you can have, then you adjust that to the perfect, mm, that perfect light. Come on, I'm talking about walking in the Spirit of God, walking in the fire of the Holy Ghost and constantly trimming our lamps and constantly removing the flies from the ointment and constantly uh, getting our place, getting our, our lives to a place where we can burn brightly and purely. That is your responsibility. No one, like, no one likes these sermons when I talk about responsibility. But if you want the light lit in your life, this is what you have to, this is what you have to do. How many are following what I'm saying? First John 1, First John 1, chapter 5. Can I give you some word? This is the message which we heard from him and declare to you that God is, God is light. He is, wow, what does that even mean? And in him is no darkness at all. No shadows. When you get to heaven, there will be no shadows. Every corner, behind every tree, every blade of grass, there's not a shadow in heaven. Because there's no natural light. It's all supernatural light. It's the light of his presence, and there will be no Wow. If, if we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie. And do not practice the truth. Mm -hmm. Verse 7. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sins. Ephesians 5, verse 8 and 9. Come on, get with me now. Once your life was full of sin's darkness, but now you have the very light of our Lord shining through you because of your union with him. Your mission is to live as children flooded with his revelation, revelation light. Ah, hallelujah. And the supernatural fruits of his light will be seen in you, goodness, righteousness, and truth. John 8, verse 12, then Jesus said, I am light to the world, and those who embrace me will experience life-giving light, and they will never walk in darkness. What is this light? Isn't it interesting that God said on day one of creation, let there be, but the sun wasn't created till day four. He created light, 
before he created the source. So I wonder if it was a different kind of light. Second Corinthians 4, 6 through 9. I should make you come back next week. For it is the God who commanded light to shine out of darkness, who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. The face of Jesus Christ is our light. So I, I don't know. I don't know if I can prove this, but I think on day one, God the Father looked over at God the Son and said, smile for me. And there was light. Ah, oh, come on, church. The light is in the face of Jesus Christ. That's our light. We don't need the sun. We need Jesus. The sun will burn up one day, but yet there will be light without the sun. Woo! <laughs> and the sun is burning up, burning up, gradually getting weaker and weaker and less and less. But light will be forever. That's why David said, don't take your face from me. Listen, uh, finally, worship team, you can you come up. It won't do any good, but you can come. Jesus said this. He said, I am the vine. And you are the branches. I am the vine. So I am the vine. You are the branches. I am the vine. You are the branches. The light comes up. The branch goes out whew, to the branches. Comes up the vine. Comes up the main shaft. Goes out to the branches. Matthew 5, verse 14. You are. Wow. 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 Wait a minute. Jesus said, I'm the light. And then Jesus comes on and says, you're the light. How can we be the light? Because the light of the... Because <laughs> the light from the main shaft, the vine, goes out to the branches. His light makes us light. We are a city set on a hill that you can't hide. Jesus. Nor do they light a lamp, put it under a basket. Stupid. Stupid. But on a lampstand, and it gives light to all, to all who are in the house. Let your light so shine. Let it. There's a let there. You have to allow your light. Why don't we get up every morning and say, Lord, let my light. Maybe that kid's song is not so childish. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. That they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. When they see your light, they glorify him. Psalms 119, final one, verse 130. The entrance of your words gives light. It gives understanding to the simple. Look at it in the Passion Translation. Break open upon you, break open your word within me until revelation light shines out. Those with open hearts are given insight into your plans. One of the reasons we preach to you on Sunday morning is so your light will shine. Your purpose in life is not to make money. Your purpose is to let your light shine. It's good that you can get ahead in life, have a retirement plan, and send your kids to college. But I'm here to tell you the word that's preached to you is for, you, is for your light to shine. The light shines on the bread. 
so that we can find it, so we can eat it, so we can take this word in. Mm. Hallelujah. Remember what I said. Darkness is not a thing. It has no substance, no particles. There is nothing to it. When the enemy comes in like a flood, I want you to remember it is darkness. It is nothing. It is defeated simply by turning on light. When the devil lies to you, when sickness comes upon you, when the, when the lawyer's b- uh, banging on your door, when the doctor says you don't have a clue, you don't have a chance, I want you to say, darkness, you are nothing. Turn on the switch. Turn on the light. Go to the Word. Jesus said, thus says the Word, and the Word is light, and the light automatically drives the darkness out. Stand to your feet and give God praise. Let your light shine. Oh, my God, I feel his presence. Don't you think maybe this would simplify things just a little bit? We spend so much time looking for de- de- looking for demons. Rebuking this, and I'm not saying rebuking's wrong. I'm just saying maybe a better path is to turn on the light. Come on. I believe I'm right in this because when the, when the devil came to Jesus in the wilderness and tempted him, every time he just said, it is written. Every time the devil lied to him, he just said, excuse me a minute. Let me turn this light switch on. Oh, where are you now? Where are you now, darkness? Where are you now, devil? How many know that might might be a good reason to read your Bible more? Get more word in you. So you can say more often, it is written, which turns the light on. We're going to lay hands on some folk right now in the name of Jesus. And this word that's been preached is going to set you free. And we're not going to have to rebuke anything. We're just going to repeat the word over you. If you're sick, your body needs to conform back to what God made you to be. Come on. We don't have to rebuke sickness. We can just command your body to conform to the image of God. Come on. Financial difficulties. Whatever it might be, whatever you're facing, if I pray for one or a dozen or a hundred, whatever it is. But at the same time, I want you to go to the altars. If you're not coming up for prayer, go to the tables, rather, and take in the bread. Take in the wine, as it were. Receive the body and blood of Jesus. And turn your light on. If you need prayer, get up here right now. If not, come to the table. Come to the table. Come to the table. And let's receive his body and blood. Oh, I feel the Lord in this place. If you need prayer for any reason, come, 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 come. Hallelujah. in the house, church. Come on, if you need prayer, you need to get down here. You need to come quickly. You'll live the night. I want to be like Samuel. 